Welcome to Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert, a podcast sponsored by the Healing Lives Center. Discover how to love and lead your family well and biblically. God created sex, marriage, and the family for our stewardship, growth, and benefit. My heart and passion is to teach, train, educate, and disciple Christians that want strong marriages and families. The Healing Life Center has been serving Christians since the year 2000. Its mission is to be a center for sex, trauma, and marriage education and transformation, where we offer counseling, coaching, courses, and speaking services to you, your church, or ministry. Check us out at HealingLives.com. Welcome back. We're looking at Lost in Transnation, a child psychiatrist's guide out of the madness. And as we're seeing is his madness. Chapter 7, Emma or Oliver. And that's what we're going to look at today is this person, this, this young woman, it's who it is. Is she Emma or is she Oliver? And so let me unpack, um, share up here, unpack this story. I'm going to kind of just kind of go through some highlights because we have a... Uh, a dilemma to answer basically so it's pieces of her story so 15 year old emma um, this is where it start where she starts she's in the emergency room after slashing her arm with a razor her father texts me photos and i'm alarmed at the number of wounds too many to count and their depth they're not the superficial scratches she made in the past with a paper clip emma will need many stitches but thankfully she did not hit the ra radial artery that uh, courses just under the skin of her wrist. If she had, Chris might have contacted me from the morgue. Emma's short life has been filled with adversity. Her mother committed suicide when she was six, and Emma has not had a positive female role model. A speech defect has led to extreme shyness. She has no siblings or family nearby, and her father works long hours. For Emma, making friends was always a challenge. Most kids just couldn't understand what she, that, what she said. She was in speech therapy for a few years. In seventh grade, things worsened. Emma was bullied throughout the year. She had some friends but struggled with her changing body and was not adequately prepared for her period. Then came the lockdowns. Emma isolated in her room. Her real life social uh, contacts dwindled and she made a few friends online. Um, she was terrified of COVID and refused to leave home for days at a time. While Emma was never expressed any problems with being a girl at the start of ninth grade, she cut her hair and began wearing baggy androgynous clothing, and her grades fell. When Emma told Chris she was omnisexual, then transgender, he was stunned. His gut said, no, she's not transgender. There's something else going on, and, and he contacted me, Dr. Grossman. Uh, I met with Chris to gather a history on Emma and the family, and he in, he impressed me as a loving and devoted father who was struggling on his own to raise a daughter with multiple challenges. Emma had been in, there in therapy twice before after his wife's death and during the bullying at school. He emphasized that he fully supported everything LGBT and he su supported Emma if she really was lesbian or transgender, but he believed it was premature to make those decisions. First, he told me, she needs help dealing with all her hardships, past and present. She needs to handle stress better, like herself, make friends, um, experience a romance, grow up more. He hoped, um, and I, I'd agree because he couldn't trust a therapist who'd automatically accept Emma's self-diagnosis. So true. At our first meeting, Emma told me she uh, first heard about being transgender at school, but it wasn't until she met her online friends that she really started to think about it. They identified as trans or non-binary. They all loved Ty Turner and others on YouTube, TikTok, and Twitter. She described me, to me uh, what she what was essentially binge-watching YouTube videos of girls on testosterone celebrating their deeper voices and growing facial hair and body hair and, for some, the removal of their breasts. Emma said she identified as trans because she wants her periods to stop and for her chest to be flat. She wants people to look at her uh, and think, that's a guy. If only those things could happen, she told me, she'd feel so good. Emma admitted that since bu being bullied in the seventh grade, she rarely spoke with anyone at school. To this day, she becomes sweaty and shaky at the very thought of it. Hanging out on Discord is much easier because her speech defect is a non-issue. She was lonely, sad, and worried. She avoided mirrors, cried frequently, and had irritability, poor concentration and motivation, didn't enjoy anything, and was without in much hope um, that things would improve unless she was able to live as a boy. Emma complained that her father refused to call her the name she picked, Oliver, and to use the pronouns he, him. She heard that, um, uh, that there are parents out there who refuse to accept their child's gender identity 
um, but she was surprised when she came out to him to discover he was one of them because he'd always been caring and responsive to her needs. Now she saw him as bigoted and disrespectful and their relationship was often hostile. A few times she called him transphobic. Emma was easily overwhelmed by her strong emotions and worked hard to avoid them. She became distraught when Chris misgendered her and her friends or voiced opinions with which um, she disagreed. On several occasions she felt an urge to harm herself, Emma told me, but she did not want to die. I agreed with Chris. This is the doctor speaking. Emma latched on to the idea that becoming Oliver was relieve, would, would relieve her emotional struggles. She requires therapy to explore what's really going on, why she's fleeing her femininity, and to treat her trauma, poor self-regard, and symptoms of anxiety and depression. Considering her symptoms and family history, I placed Emma on an antidepressant and taught her some skills to use when, when overwhelmed, um, and created a crisis plan to follow if she felt the urge to harm herself. I explained that I'm the type of therapist that sees gender as only one part of the large, complex tapestry that's Emma, and that we will examine together the entire tapestry in order to understand her. People are complicated, I told her, and gender is related to deep issues that take time to understand. Until then, I would not affirm Oliver, because that places her on a, a specific path that may not be right for her, and once on it, can be hard to leave. I was optimistic that um, as we got to know each other, she was able to share her experiences and feelings and learn how to cope sad, um, sadness and frustration, she'd feel better. I, was also, uh, I would also work with her father, I said, so that he could understand her better. Chris arranged to restart speech therapy and nutrition counseling. Emma learned about communicating her feelings and skills for coping with intense emotion. Her access to the internet was limited and her social media monitored. Uh, with time, I learned that Emma had been molested by an older male cousin and that she'd been exposed to misogynistic pornography. So with medication, and psychotherapy, speech therapy, and parent support, Emma slowly began to feel better. Chris got uh, better at listening and communicating with her daughter. For example, he was able to tell Emma that a rejection of the, of the name he and her mother had carefully picked was painful for him. While she hoped he'd eventually give in and call her Oliver, she was able to accept his position. Chris learned about gender dysphoria and joined a parent support group. He established boundaries about names, pronouns, hair, and clothing with which they could both live. He made changes at work, allowing him to be home with Emma returned when Emma returned from school. And they bonded while preparing and having dinner and on road trips to visit some cousins. For her birthday, they went to the pet store and bought a lizard. And the three of us were working well together, and Chris and I were hopeful. Emma looked forward to speaking with me every week, and trust was building. I hoped I could be a strong feminine role model she never had. After six months, Emma showed improvement. Her mood was better and she was more motivated and be able to focus. Chris uh, took her out to celebrate an improved report card. She began to speak in class and joined an after-school photography club. While she still identified as a boy and was called Oliver by her friend, she no longer obsessed about her breasts and periods. She was able to agree to disagree with her father about gender-related issues, at least for the time being. Then. Out of the blue, Emma discovered the girls who had bullied her in, in middle school wrote cruel, humiliating posts about her on social media. Home alone and overwhelmed by distress, Emma slashed her arm. Whew, the emergency room doctor wanted to admit Emma to the psychiatric unit, but Chris was unsure. He was concerned that the hospital staff would immediately zero in on Emma's gender identity. He told me the ER forms asked for her gender, preferred name, and pronouns. So Chris wondered. When they learned he was still calling her Emma, would they paint him as an unsupportive parent or worse? After all he'd done to strengthen their bond and address Emma's challenge, challenges, he was terrified the hospital would place a wedge between them. That's when he texted me the photos and wanted to speak. I wanted to know more about that, what happened, specifically if Emma's cutting was a genuine suicide attempt and why she follow up, um, why she, she didn't follow our crisis plan but I was not able to evaluate her or play a significant part in her care because I was not a part of the staff at the hospital. But I knew that Chris's worries were justified. The moment Emma walks through the hospital doors, she would become Oliver. And this is the title of the next section, The Hospitals Produce ROGD, Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria. A nurse working in the psychiatric unit for adolescents in New, uh, New England emailed me. This is a quote from the, from the nurse. I'm having a hard time. 
I feel I'm doing something wrong with the kids. The biggest issue here is identity. 50 to 70% of them are queer or trans. The vast majority are girls. They all have depression and suicidal ideation and are on meds. 50% have been have a sexual in, self-injurious behavior. When I admit a patient, I go to the ambulance bay and the patient is on a stretcher. I have to introduce myself with my pronouns and ask the patient their pronouns. That's the first thing I'm supposed to do. It just feels wrong. There's a checklist of questions I'm supposed to ask them. What's your sexual orientation? What's your gender identity? I, press it, I preface it with, I know these questions are really weird, but it feels like it feels, like, it feels terrible to ask these things. Sometimes they don't even understand what I'm talking about. She told me, I asked one girl, why do you think you are trans? She said, I hate getting my period. I asked her if binders were given in the hospital to the girls, and she said yes. If the girl asked for one and she's not suicidal, the doctor writes an order. And continuing that quote, all the other RNs where we support trans right buttons my nurse manager says to make sure to use preferred pronouns in charting, but it will say in the chart not to share gender information with parents, even if the patient is 13. It's wrong. It makes me so mad. I want this stuff to stop. I'm aware of the hazards posed by adolescent psychiatric units with speaking with Alex Kaipo, the executive director of Charlton School, a small therapeutic program for teens in the upstate New York. He described an explosion of ROGD the rapid onset gender dysphoria patients at his facility that began around 2019. 19% of them arrived directly from the hospital and many had self-injurious behaviors. The hospitals, he told me, produce the ROGD. They promote and encourage the new identities. For 60% of patients, the onset was in the hospital. That's where it first surfaced. He also noted that powerful peer culture on adolescent units and the live daughter or dead son mantra staff repeats with parents. Upon admission of their child to Charlton, parents said affirmation was mandatory or their kid's self-injury will continue. So we went with the affirmation of affirming and with staff tripping over each other to not misgender. But staff did not see improvement in their young patients. After a while, Alex told me, we decided we are hurting kids. They discovered Stella O'Malley, an Irish psychotherapist and founder of Genspect, an organization called calling for a lower and more nuanced approach to treating gender confused youth, and invited her to train Charlton staff. We got educated, Alex said, and decided let's not play this game anymore. When pa patients arrived, staff would explain, we are not affirming, we go with birth names here. In each case, Alex told me their opposite sex identity faded, whereas students who had been affirmed at Charlton and graduated, they remain trans-identified. According to Alex, treatment at Charlton now draws from biopsychosocial models and uses exploratory approach as opposed to an affirming model. That's awesome. His staff uses a guide created by the, um, the GEDA, Gender Exploratory Therapy Association, a group of clinicians including O'Malley who advocate for exploratory psychotherapy before patients embark on irreversible medical treatment. Yes, I knew that what was in store for Emma in the hospital. But now I was on the phone with Chris and a decision had to be made. His anguish was evident. All he wanted was for Emma to be safe and get help, but it felt like a lose-lose situation. Unfortunately, there was no choice. I explained that Emma's serious self-injury required hospital admission for evaluation and stabilization. Her physical safety was our priority and even though the hospital was far from perfect, it was safer than home. If he refused admission, I told him social services would probably be called. So I arranged for a lawyer, also the parent of a gender questioning child who's been hospitalized, um, to advise him on navigating the predicament. And Emma was admitted to the adolescent psychiatric unit. Everyone agreed Emma was suffering and needed help. But what kind of help? Affirm her as Oliver or explore why she's fleeing Emma? Give her a binder or figure out why she hates her breasts? Start puberty blockers or explain that all teens have discomfort with their bodies? Emma or Oliver? Which is her authentic real self? Which identity will lead to despair, which to health and wellness? And most critical, which approach protects Emma from suicide? Those are the questions at the center of the, a heated debate taking place in medical journals and courts all, of law, um, but you haven't heard about it because the media regurgitates the Castro consensus. The governing council of the APA 
in a formal resolution about gender dysphoria categorize any approach other than prompt affirmation of Oliver to be unethical and dangerous. The U.S. federal policy of the current administration endorses early gender affirming care, that is, prompt affirming of Oliver as crucial to Emma's overall health and well being. A report prepared by Sam, SAMHSA, so Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, claims this is their quote no research indicates that gender identity change efforts are effective in altering gender identity. Research indicates that these efforts can cause significant harm, including suicide attempts and other negative behavioral health outcomes. Not true. All these authorities and many more tell us Emma's male self-perception overrides the female she was assigned at birth. Her male gender identity is simply a variant of normal development, they claim. There is no more Emma, only Oliver. And Chris and I, indeed everyone in Oliver's life, must give him space to forge his path. Even if he's only three years old, we are instructed. Only Oliver can make decisions about pronouns or aligning his body with his mind. Our job is to respect, understand, and support Oliver. We must delete our memory of him as a girl and scrap our expectation that one day Emma will be a woman. If we don't, we're at best misinformed and at worst dangerous. They want you to believe the issue has been thoroughly studied, closely examined, and there's a consensus, one voice in unison, Oliver, not Emma. Even the POTUS told parents like Chris, affirming your child's identity is one of the most powerful things you can do to keep them safe and healthy. That's why, as I explained, the moment Emma enters a hospital, she becomes Oliver. With or without Chris's agreement, staff will call her Oliver, he and him exclusively, instead of Emma, she and her, what they call her, um, what they call her birth assigned name and gender. Hospital staff are trained in how they, their gender-affirming speech creates a welcoming and safe place and warned of the dire consequences of failing to do so. Another quote, uh, once a patient tells you their name and gender, it is important to continue using them. Refusing to acknowledge their gender identity and choice of language harms the therapeutic relationship, is discriminatory, and insults the patient. Furthermore, this may add to any trauma they have already experienced and possibly foster increased thoughts of suicide and self-harm. So for example, a nurse may write in Emma's chart, a legal, which is a legal document, Oliver is having a hard day. He's preoccupied with his breasts and hips and dreading his period. I'm going to explain this once, again, because it is difficult to absorb. So, woof, Dr. Grossman, I love that you wrote this book. Health professionals, MDs and PhDs and others who went to school for many years and have lots of diplomas on their walls are telling kids like Emma that yes, it's possible to have a mismatch between your brains and bodies. Yes, you might be both male and female, neither male or female, or some combination of male or female. Yes, in fact, all that is normal. It just means you don't conform to society's rigid norms and you're def defying traditional roles and you're marching to the beat of, your, you know, of a different drummer. Your discomfort with your growing breasts or erections, it all makes sense. Your bodies are mistakes. This is gender-affirming care, and we are told ad nauseum that it saves lives. Never mind that gender is an ephemeral concept without empirical evidence supporting its existence. Oliver is nothing but a persona in Emma's mind, quite possibly a temporary one, and affirming him requires denying the objectivity, objective reality of Emma. Nevertheless, healthcare professionals are instructed GAC is medically necessary, evidence-based, and life-saving. Any other approach, we are told, is unsupportive, judgmental, does not appreciate the child, and fails to promote acceptance and inclusion of all children. I, Dr. Grossman, that wrote this book, am joined by many other clinicians in believing that Emma's body is just fine, without need for alignment. It's her trauma and psychic wounds that demand attention. Amen. Some of us support legislation protecting minors like Emma from disfiguring and sterilizing medical interventions. For speaking out, we are maligned. We are called ignorant, non-inclusive, dinosaurs, and of course, transphobic. To the Admiral, anti-trans doctors like me are preying on people's fears, and that leads to darkness and hate. I like to quote that sage Yoda from Star Wars, you know, fear is the path that leads to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. I think that people fear what they don't understand. Do you hear this? To the second most senior medical official in this 
country, my views about helping teens like Emma, which are shared by some of the giants in this field, lead to fear, anger, and suffering. Mom, what am I? As discussed earlier, Jason Rafferty, a pediatrician and child psychiatrist, is the lead author of the um, American Academ Academy of Pediatricians policy statement on transgender and gender diverse adolescents. In the statement published in the prestigious journal Pediatrics, Rafferty regurgitates the articles of faith, conflating sex and gender along the way. Sex is a label assigned at birth, gender identity is fluid, and maybe male, f female, somewhere in between, a combination of both or neither. He warns against binary notions of gender and implies that any approach outside of affirming Oliver is unsupportive and judgmental, lacking understanding and appreciation of Emma's gender experience and more likely to result in more mental health issues. Rafferty's views are not supported by the evidence. Remember that, there, this is not supported. Nevertheless, he wants doctors like myself to prompt, promptly place Emma on the trans assembly line. My medical training included an unspoken commandment. It wasn't explicitly stated. It was absorbed by osmosis. Thou shalt trust the AMA, the CDC, the Department of HHS, the American Psychiatric Association, and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Thou shalt turn to them and other medical authorities and clinical guidance because they speak truth. But now the medical establishment is demanding I go against all I know about human biology, child development, and psychotherapy. They instruct me to endorse Emma's irrational rejection of her sexed body. They expect me to stand by and watch as she constructs her own reality and to recognize that reality is valid. But I know that emotionally healthy people live in reality, no matter how painful it may be, and that it's my job as a doctor to represent that reality. When parents, teachers, and doctors fail to represent reality to children and youth, they do a terrible disservice. For example, in the first season of TLC's reality series, I Am Jazz, Jazz's mother, Jeanette, describes an instance when, as a young child, Jazz, then Jared, asked her, Mom, what am I? Meaning her son asked, am I a girl or a boy? Jeanette says she answered, well, what do you feel like? And Jared answered, of course, that he felt like a girl, and it seems like that, um, that was that. I want to acknowledge the very challenging position of all parents with a child with gender, gender dysphoria. But in this case, the mom's response was incorrect. The proper answer would have been, you're a boy who feels like a girl right now. Your feelings can change, but your sex cannot. Returning to Chris, he and my parents, uh, he and many parents instinctively know the born in the wrong body notion is rubbish. And that's why when it comes to gender, so many no longer trust the medical system. They know they're um, kids better than anyone else, and they know they are not the opposite sex. Rather, to the distressed young person, it's a way of coping with their autism, depression, or anxiety. It's also a way to gain acceptance of peers. Parents know that pills and injections and operations are not the answer. Chris is certainly not having any of it, no matter what the medical authorities and the president tell him. He's right to hesitate before placing his daughter in the hospital, which, as he saw in the ER, seems like a mouthpiece for trans ideology. The hospital crystallized Oliver in Emma's mind. Instead of focusing on the cyberbullying, emotional dysregulation, and the other issues that led to her self-injury. We know from decades of research that a secure bond with Chris is perhaps the single most critical factor predicting Emma's future flourishing. The bond with her father must be strengthened, not undermined with charges of bias and transphobia. I have another concern I didn't mention to Chris. The other patients on the unit. Imagine all the troubled teens with nose rings and blue hair who identify as who knows what. Days before I, uh, before I came across the article, uh, quoting adolescent psychiatrist um, from Finland, ex expert on gender dysphoric youth, as mentioned in the previous chapter, in, especially for girls, sharing things for, with a circle of friends is really important. According to him, it is common for psychiatric symptoms to spread among girls in the same hospital ward. Will Emma leave the hospital with her boy identity more concretized um, than before? Will one of the other girls tell her how to buy tea online or suggest she leave home and seek refuge with a glitter family or in the LGBT shelter? I know those things are likely, but I also know, considering the severity of her self-harm, we had no choice. 
I feel outraged that my profession is so entrenched in this trans crusade articles of faith, so angry that Chris must deal with not only with his disturbed daughter, but with a system stacked against their long-term interests. Upon admitting her to the hospital, he should feel relief. She'll, she'll begin to heal, not anxiety that she'll get worse. We should all be on the same team helping Emma, I reflect. This is madness. Okay, so what happened? With the memory of Emma's bloody arm haunting me, Chris will meet with the treatment team. They will likely explain that the um, unconditional acceptance of Oliver is, you guessed it, medically necessary, even life-saving. You must validate and support your son. The doctors and social workers will soberly tell him, implying that any other approach uh, with Emma is inv invalidating and unsupportive and could lead to disaster. Chris may be asked, as many parents have told me they were, uh, which do you prefer, a live son or a dead daughter? He must be prepared to hear frightening statistics. For example, more than half of transgender youth seriously consider attempting suicide. 41% of all transgender and gender nonconforming youth attempt suicide. Transgender youth attempt suicide nearly six times more than non-LGBTQ youth. Those stats are certainly cause for concern, but how accurate are they? And should they guide treatment decisions? Does Chris really have only two choices, a live Oliver or a dead Emma? More and more parents find themselves emotionally manipulated by experts with the transition or death narrative. They're led to believe that only by denying their parental instincts will their child survive. Of course, any risk of suicide demands attention and assessment. However, there's no evidence the affirm or suicide mantra is true. You hear that? There is no evidence that this is true. While it is accurate that the suicidality of gender distressed adolescents and young adults is higher than the general population, it is similar to those with men other mental health con conditions. Michael Biggs reported that as at London's GIDS, over 11 years and among 15,000 patients, including the waiting list, there were four suicides. That represented an estimated annual suicide rate of 13 per, one per 100,000, making them very rare events. Here's the most important nugget. Two of the suicides were of individuals on the waiting list, presumably not getting treatment, but the other were of patients in treatment being affirmed in counseling and possibly receiving blockers and opposite sex hormones. These data contradict claims of an epidemic of suicide in gender distressed youth and the trope of transition or die. When Finland's expert Katalia was asked about the claim that trans youth have an increased risk of suicide and therefore urgently need treatment and support, she stated, it's purposeful disinformation, the spreading of which is irresponsible. So here's how I suggested Chris present his preferences for Emma's care to the hospital um, crazies. I told him to bring someone supportive to the meeting, even if that person doesn't say a word. He needed someone there on his side, even via virtual connection, like another parent or a gender kid um, a parent of a gender kid he met in a tr parent support group. Try to remain calm, I told him. Remember that the staff are probably decent people following the guidance of those they trust. They don't realize they've been misinformed. They haven't thought as deeply about the issue as you have. And if you get emotional, it's okay. Your strong feelings are understandable. She's your precious child. So here is, I'm going to read through this dialogue as to how, how um, Dr. Grossman coached him to speak to the doctors. So Dr. A says, Hello, Chris. I'm Dr. A, Oliver's psychiatrist. My pronouns are they, them. This is Xander, Oliver's social worker. His pronouns are Zizer. Chris, hello. Good to meet you. I appreciate all you're doing for Emma. Dr. A, Emma? Oh, yes. We heard you use Oliver's birth assigned name and pronouns. Chris, Actually, I don't want to get off on the wrong foot, but my wife and I picked the name Emma months before she was born, and we thought about it for a long time. It was not assigned at birth. That makes it sound arbitrary and thoughtless, and it wasn't those things at all. I want to start off saying, I know you mean well. I'm not here to argue, but to let you know where I stand as Emma's parent, and I also have some requests. Yes, I call my daughter Emma. She wants me to call her Oliver, and I know that in the hospital you do that, but I don't believe it's in her best interest. Xander says, Chris, you may mean well, but an affirming approach is best for your son's mental health. It might even be life-saving. 
That means using his preferred na pronoun, name and pronouns, Chris. I'm glad you realize that I mean well, because I have always been devoted to Emma. I've considered that my most important job since the day we found out we were pregnant, and I have no plans to stop now. My daughter has experienced diff different traumas and challenges, and I have always done my best to make sure her mental health issues are addressed. May I ask why you believe my acting as if she's a boy is best for her mental health? Dr. A. Chris, it's not about acting. Gender identity is real. Oliver is real. Chris continues. I know you generally believe that, and Emma does too. But I'll tell you, once the whole um, thing started, I've been digging deep into gender, and I have to say, I can't wrap my head around the idea that Emma can pick from dozens of gender identities and change it on a dime, construct her own reality, and hers is the only reality that counts. Hard science like biology and genetics says she's been female since the moment of conception and will remain female forever. That makes no sense to me. Emma can never be a boy, only a synthetic version of a boy. I don't understand how you can call that real. I don't agree that everyone makes their own gender reality and we all must accept it or else. I believe there's one reality. Dr. A. Chris, you're confusing gender with sex. Chris replies, no, I know the difference. Emma's sex is hardwired and cannot be changed. Her gender is how she feels at the moment or wants others to see her. Those are the correct definitions, right? Xander, yes. Chris continues. We were talking about acting and what's real. Emma is female and can never be a boy. It's not doing her any kindness to act like she just construct can just construct her own reality. Reality is fixed. If she denies that, she's going to pay a price. It could be a very high price, and I want to protect her from that. That's what I believe, and there's there are many other many who agree with me. Chris, there's as Xander says, Chris, there's no debate on uh, about there. There's a consensus. Every major medical organization agrees. Chris replies, I've heard that, but I believe it's not as clear cut as you may think. Please hear me out. Ever since my daughter told me she is transgender, I've been reading everything I can, listening to podcasts and interviews with doctors, therapists, and parents, and I discovered, maybe you're not aware, there's a fierce debate about the best way to help these kids. I'm not a doctor or a therapist, but I know that treatment of transgender kids is controversial. I thought we might um, dis disagree today, so I put together some articles that you probably haven't seen. Here they are. I'm asking that you please look at them. They are by highly respected professionals, such as Dr. Stephen Levine of, at Case Western Uni Re Reserve University. And he has been caring for transgender people for 50 years. There's also an article by Zenith Zucker, who for decades ran one of the only clinics in the world for ch children with dys gender dysphoria and has seen uh, 2,000 kids. They both argue that social transition is an intervention with consequences. They are highly qualified voices who are silenced by the authorities you trust. Xander. I've heard of them, and they are outliers. Chris. Also included in the articles are the statements by medical authorities in Britain, Sweden, Norway, Finland, announcing that they have studied all the data carefully and there's a severe lack of research on kids like Emma, and it is unknown whether affirming them has, has any long-term benefits. Dr. A. In this hospital, we follow WPATH standard of care. Chris. Oh, yes. I know about WPATH. Their standards of care are highly controversial. As you know, over 2,000 health professionals signed a declaration saying they're unethical and damaging. Listen, I'm not trying to be difficult. I just want the best for Emma and want you to understand there isn't a consensus about how to help her. Um, there's a debate. This hospital follows WPATH, but those countries I just mentioned reject WPATH, and that's the point. These controversy, there's controversy, not consensus. Xander. But Chris, Oliver is saying this is who he is, his authentic self, and he needs your validation. He is really hurting about your lack of support. Studies show he'll be less depressed and feel better about himself if you support him. Chris, please stop saying I don't support Emma. With respect, you don't even know us. The opposite is true. I don't want to get angry. I want this meeting to be productive. Please stop saying that. Like many teenagers, Emma must learn how to deal with frustration and disappointment when things don't go her way. That includes me me continuing to call her Emma. Emma doesn't know who she is. Last year she begged me to, to wear padded bras and get a navel ring. 
Now she says she's a boy. She's trying different identities. I'll do anything for Emma, but I draw the line at denying the truth. I won't lie to her and say she's a boy, even though it would put a smile on her face for a while. That's not a kindness. That leads her down a path toward medicalization, and that's dangerous. I know there are some studies that show short-term improvement if I, as you say, validate her, but I know they're not the gold standard of studies and which are randomized and controlled. But in any case, I have her lifelong health and happiness in mind, not her short, not the short term. And there are no studies that indicate the long-term results are positive. You've shared some very scary statistics about suicide, and it feels to me like you're saying, if I don't accept Emma as my son, she could very well kill herself. I don't know if you have kids, Dr. A and Xander, but if you do, I'm sure you understand how hard it is to even say those words. I have learned that suicide is a complicated subject and people don't kill themselves just for one reason. For example, because their father won't affirm their new identity. Dr. A. It is true. Suicide is complicated. Chris continues. I looked up the suicide rates for girls uh, Emma's age. Thankfully, it's extremely rare for girls her age to kill themselves. Out of 100,000 girls her age, around five will commit suicide. Of course, every suicide is a tragedy, but the risk of Emma is, for Emma is extremely low. I also learned that suicide attempts may be unrelated to a real intent to die. It may be a manipulation, a cry for help, or, as I suspect with Emma's, a way to cope with overwhelming distress. You just met Emma, so there's a lot you don't know about her. My daughter has had many challenges. Since she was little, Emma was very anxious around people because of her speech. She had trouble making friends. My wife committed suicide. Emma was sexually abused, and she's been bullied. Sadly, there hasn't been any mother substitute in her life because my family lives far away and both of our grandparents, her grandparents passed. I think you'll agree, that's a lot for a 15-year-old. And this was all before she had any gender dysphoria whatsoever. I know there's evidence that kids like Emma are more vulnerable than the general teen population to suicidal thoughts, self-harm, and suicide. But it is unclear how significant a role their transgender identity plays, if any. She's already at risk due to my wife's suicide having an anxiety disorder, being bullied, and possibly being lesbian or bisexual. All those things increase her risk of suicide. So it's incorrect to put it all on my not accepting her boy identity. You shouldn't do that. And there's no evidence that allowing her to transition will decrease her suicide risk. In the material I've, I've given you, there's an article by Dr. Michael Biggs summarizing research at the world's largest clinic for kids like Emma. Over 11 years, the annual suicide rate was 13 suicides out of 100,000, which is a whole lot lower than those statistics you threw at me. And please hear this. It's important. There was no difference in the suicide rates of those who had received treatment and those who were um, on the waiting list for treatment. Dr. A. Well, you certainly have done a lot of research. I'll give you that much. But as I keep saying, your position goes against the guidelines of every major medical organization. Chris. Yes, I know, Dr. Anzander. I want to say this again. I know you mean well. I'm not here to argue, but to let you know where I stand as Emma's parent. I think you generally believe if I don't affirm Emma as Oliver, her mental health will plummet. I see it differently. I hope you'll think about what I've said and review the literature I've given you with an open mind. In the meantime, my daughter must stay with you for a stabilization and adjustment of her meds. I can't control what name and pronouns you and your staff use with her. But I want to be clear, I don't want anyone on your staff bringing up transgender ideology with Emma, thereby encouraging her on a path towards risky medical interventions. That includes gender dysphoria, binders, hormone blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgery. If Emma brings up those topics, staff should refer her to her outpatient therapist or myself. If I learn that any of your staff volunteer those topics for discussion, I will hold you responsible for any negative consequences that result. Finally, I am a loving, responsible parent, and I'm a secure bond with me protects her against suicide. I expect that bond to be honored during her hospital stay. If I learn that your staff undermines my parental authority or says something disparaging about me, I will hold you responsible for any negative consequences that result. Wow, that's amazing. There's a lot there. To be sure, I encourage Chris to practice making these points with a friend before getting in the meeting. I advise him to bring notes and to keep returning to his main points. So what are the main points here? He knows Emma best and is devoted to her. She needs treatment for emotional disturbances that predated gender dysphoria. 
There is no consensus about treatment of kids like Emma. There is no evidence that affirmation helps in the long term or decreases her risk of suicide. So you're probably wondering, what happened to the nurse from the psych unit? You won't be surprised that a few months later she wrote, I spoke with management about my concerns, but was basically told this is how we are handling these issues. If you can't accept it, um, this might not be the place, the job for you. So I resigned as a nurse at the adolescent inpatient facility. I could not tolerate what was happening and being promoted with the teens there. Pay attention, everyone. This is how it works. There are a few rare individuals, like the nurse above, who speak up and question the pro-affirmation narrative, but their concerns are dismissed by the higher-ups. What can she do? She's one person against Big Brother. She has a conscience and can't go to work each day, harm people, and go home and have dinner as usual. So she quits, and you, you know who's left. Dr. A, Xander, the nurse manager, the nurses wearing the trans right buttons, those are, that's who's left. They. They do as they, they're told and go home and have dinner as usual. No questions, no doubts, no lost sleep over Emma's um, in their care. That's the disturbing truth and the reason you must be prepared. Thank you for tuning in to the Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert podcast. It has been an honor to serve. If you are struggling, have questions, or in need, Dr. Gilbert offers a free consultation for new clients. Check us out at healinglives.com to book a call. If this has been helpful to you, please share it, leave a review, and help us get the word out so that we can see lives changed, marriages transformed, and more people come into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. The Healing Life Center offers online courses, programs, books, intensives, and other services to help you live biblically and well. Discover more resources on YouTube and in Dr. Gilbert's Healing Marriage Facebook group, The Healing Marriage.